Are we uh, are we ready to uh, begin? I think I've got 10.30. So, <clears throat> Uh, as chairman of Division Two of the House Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This public meeting is pertaining to the university system and the community college system. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with emergency order one, I am emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen, if necessary, participate in this meeting by, by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should email LBA underscore fiscal at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. LBA staff are on the meeting assisting us. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done right by roll call. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Representative Lynn, if you could Call the roll. I'd appreciate it. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Bucco. Uh, thank you. I'm present. I'm at my home in Conway, and there's no one else in the house. Thank you. Uh, Representative Danielson is not present. Representative Heath. I'm here in Manchester, Mary Heath, and I'm here in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'm home alone. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Representative Bob Lynn. I'm uh, here at my home in Wyndham, and I'm... Uh, my wife and son are in the house, but uh, I'm alone in the room. Uh, Representative uh, Murray. Good morning. I'm Kate Murray here in Newcastle. My dog's with me. My husband's in the basement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Representative Petrie. Yes, uh, Representative Petrie here. Uh, I'm in Farmington. Uh, my wife and dog, as usual, are ro roaming around the halls. And Representative Umberger. Thank you. Uh, Kate, we're going to have to get your husband out of the basement. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's really okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Representative Karen Umberger, and then I'm in my home in Kearsarge, and my husband is wandering around the house and will be in and out. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin this morning uh, with... Um, <clears throat> The are you interim chancellor, acting I am. chancellor? Okay, uh, in interim, <laughs> interim, <laughs> interim. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to make that permanent. Uh, interim chancellor uh, for the community college system, uh, Susan Huard, and uh, I believe that uh, you sent the presentation to us. And if you would um, introduce anyone that has joined you on our Zoom call and uh, I'd appreciate it. And we're, we're looking forward to it. And uh, just so that uh, you know, um, we're going to hold our questions because we're going to gather back at um, about 1230 so that we can uh, ask the questions at that time because we are on a, um, 
based on yours and uh, UNH's agreement, you would each have half an hour. So, all right, if, if I could ask you to proceed, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Umberger. Um, as is the case with Representative Mari, my husband too is in the basement. <laughs> He's an avid woodworker um, and I'm at home in Hookset. And I've brought with me uh, Shannon Reed, who is our legislative affairs liaison and Scott Fields, who is our chief of operations. And so thank you so much for this uh, time. Um, I've met some of you, but not all of you. Um, I've actually been in New Hampshire since 2010 and I was the president of Manchester Community College for about nine and a half years. And then I thought I retired, um, but in New Hampshire fashion, I didn't. Uh, and when Chancellor Gattel left, I was asked to step in and I was very honored to do that to support our seven colleges and my colleagues. So what I'd like to do in our half an hour is give you an overview uh, of the, the system and what it is we do and, and, and who we serve and, and what motivates us. So having said that, um, I've been asked the question recently, um, well, you've got seven different missions uh, because you have seven colleges. And I've said, no, that's, that is not the case. We absolutely have seven colleges. We're at 12 different locations in the state, but we all have the same mission. And I was trying to think of a way for people to understand how we could have seven independent accreditations, but we could still be driven by one mission. And then I actually thought about the Common Man Restaurants, you know, an institution here in the state of New Hampshire. When you go to a Common Man Restaurant, there, there are certain things that you can expect. And whether you are uh, in the Southern end of the state or the Northern end of the state, there's a certain flavor that comes through. And I think that's a good comparison to the community colleges. The thing that makes a community college a community college is its location. We are tied to the people and the businesses in a particular area. That's what makes us who we are. But in Shannon, I'll ask you to bring up our slides and I'm going to talk about a few of these. I will not go through every single one. Uh, but just to give you a flavor about who, who we are. So two things drive us. That first one is the mission that I've been talking about. And our goal is to serve the people of the state. In fact, one of the things, one of our distinguishing characteristics is that more than 93% of the students in our system are New Hampshire residents. Um, this year, I think our, our youngest student is uh, in about uh, 16 and our most seasoned student is in her 80s. And that I bring those numbers up just to give you a sense that community colleges are here to serve people when they need us. So here you go, here's a, a showing of all of us all across the state, uh, in fact, our goal was to have a community college or a center within about a half an hour of everybody in the state. So there's the uh, sort of the, the location business. The other piece is affordable. And in another slide, I'll show you what the impact is of when we have to raise our tuition. And frankly, I'm very grateful to you because of your assistance, we've been able to maintain our tuition. Uh, currently the state funds nearly half of what we do. Um, so looking at our slide here, there are different things one can do at a community college. One can gain a certificate, an associate degree, short training, longer term training. We do customized training with companies and we serve our high school students. We create pathways for students to move to gain college credit in high school and then move on to the community college or the other college of their choice. In fact, our credits in our Running Start program are accepted at more than 200 colleges and universities. Um, and we, we're increasing that number because as our high school students go forward to uh, colleges that we've not yet 
talked with, we add them to the list. We speak uh, with folks at different colleges across the country. And there's a whole bunch of programming that we do that is designed exactly for transfer uh, to four-year institutions. But our big game is to be agile so that as things come up, we can respond. Uh, one of the recent examples that has come up is with the LPN program. You know, we used to be in the LPN business quite a while ago. And then as the hospitals changed their priorities and they moved to magnet hospital status, they were telling us very clearly that there wasn't going to be a role for LPNs. So slowly but surely, we went out of the LPN business. However, in the last two years, the need for LPNs, particularly in nursing homes and healthcare systems has arisen. And so now we've gone back into that business, having started the program again at River Valley Community College, but we're doing things in a different way. Where before we would have started a brand new program at whichever of the next college was going to do it, now we have a different uh, way of operating. Uh, the program has started at River Valley. This semester, Lakes Region started a new cohort of the LPN program. And frankly, this is a model that we're going to continue doing. It may be that the state no longer needs this program sometime in the future. And instead of creating it at every single college, we'll bring it where it needs to be. And then when the need subsides, we essentially will fold it back up and bring it back to the host college. We are in discussions about other examples like that. And I bring that up because it gives you a sense of how we are responsive. Shannon, let's go on. Okay, so I've talked about mission, our mission to be affordable, to be accessible, to serve the businesses in the communities. It's all supported by this notion that um, we've been talking about for quite a number of years, 65 by 25, which I suspect you're all very familiar with. And so our goal here, based on an analysis that was done by a, a, a professor at Georgetown University, is that for our state to flourish economically, 65% of our adult residents by 2025 need some kind of post-secondary training. And I put it that way because some people need short-term certificates, some people need longer experiences, some people need associates, baccalaureate and graduates degrees, but all together we're meaning to serve the need of our state. And here are the ways that we do it, some of which I've already mentioned and some of which we continue to pursue. We're looking for more opportunities with high school students. Frankly, the pandemic has changed so many things for us. And as we think about the, the high school students who are going to go forward, some of whom haven't been uh, in a classroom in about a year. Now those folks are still moving along. They're still going to graduate from high school. What is it that we do to support them as they gain the skill sets that they worked on on their own, but they're going to be moving on. So high school students, we still need to be affordable. One of the things that um, has come up is, you know, why is it that the uh, community college system uh, and the university system didn't work hand in glove on dealing with the pandemic? Well, we did. We, we certainly have spoken with one another and so on, but our needs are very different. Our students are in the community. We have some residential students at two of our colleges, but our needs are very different. In fact, if you look at what happened to community colleges on account of the pandemic, you, you, you get a sense that, that the folks that we serve are living a different life. Uh, my predecessor, Chancellor Gattel, wrote a paper called The Two New Hampshires. And in it, he talked about um, the people uh, of means and the people who don't have opportunity. Well, we have an example right now with a pandemic. People anticipated that what's been true for decades would happen. And that would be that community colleges would see this huge growth in enrollment because our 
sort of the, the, the old saw is when times are bad, community college enrollment is up. And that makes sense because people are trying to um, you know, brush up on their skills or achieve new skills. That is not what happened. In fact, nationally, community colleges are down any place from 10 to 15 percent. And we are in that boat. We are, you know, in that in that level of a decline in our enrollment. Um, and that's because the, the students that we serve are on the front lines of retail. They are the LNAs in nursing homes. They are the young parents who are, you know, have kids at home. One of the uh, challenges for us, our, frankly, the 18 and 19 year olds who are going to come to the community college came and they're doing well. It's the 25 plus year olds who have had to step out because of working overtime, because of their needs at home and so on. And again, we look exactly like what's happening nationally to community college students. Uh, Shannon, let's move on a bit here. And, and uh, I'll leave this for you to read at some point, but what we do changes, but not at the core. We need to help the people who need to retrain. And in fact, a, a lot of the programming that we're building right now is exactly to help people back to work. We worry about folks in the retail industry and in the hospitality industry. Those two industries in particular have been profoundly affected, as you know. Well, what are the transferable skills? I was on a call a few weeks ago um, and we we're talking about the needs in healthcare, which is, as you know, a huge employment sector in our state. And one of the employers, former employers said, if I had two resumes in front of me and one was from um, an RN who, who didn't, um, who, who basically had gone to school and was now applying to work. And there was a second person there who had worked in hospitality, um, perhaps been a bartender. Sight unseen, before I talk to them, I'm already thinking I want that person who's been a bartender. And it really got me thinking about what are the skills that a bartender needs that are highly transferable to the healthcare industry. Bartenders are certainly used to listening to people's life problems. They're used to dealing with people at different points in their life and they have refined their problem solving skills. That's a good illustration of many of our students. These are folks that are working and they have accumulated skills. They need a flexible schedule. Um, when the CARES money first came out, um, it, it was doled out to colleges based upon FTE, which is full-time equivalent. And that didn't support us to the degree that we needed because two thirds of our student body is part-time, one third full-time. So if you're going to come up with a full-time equivalent, you kind of mash together two or three people because those two or three students might each be taking one or two classes. And so it would take three students, for instance, to be the equivalent of one FTE. But those three students have needs. Every one of our college campuses has now opened a food bank. Every one of our colleges is helping to connect students to all the services our, our state has, fuel assistance, rent assistance, and so on. And when the uh, next round of funding, Carissa, came out, we were very grateful that our senators really championed uh, a mix. So it is FTE, but it also is headcount. So when I tell you that we serve 26,000 people within our state every year, we need people, the very talented faculty and staff that we have to serve these individuals well. And it is a different formula much like before I was referring to the difference in, in how COVID affected the community colleges uh, versus our uh, residential colleges, same sort of an issue. We, we have different needs based upon who and how we're serving. And Shannon has uh, put up on the screen the fact that we pay very careful attention 
to what the needs of the state are. And there's very good alignment between the programming that we do and the job opportunities that exist. Shannon, next slide, please. All right, a little bit here about how we work with our various companies. Um, two examples for you. One is Nashua Community College and its work with BAE Systems. They, the, the company and the college work together to meet a need that the company had for microelectronics technicians. So there's a program now at Nashua that's been there for probably a couple of years that trains people and takes people from making a very basic wage to a living wage, because ultimately that's what we're aiming for. Um, in, in one meeting, I did let my former background in Connecticut show, and I said that the mission of community colleges is to create middle-class taxpayers. And uh, one of the commissioners said to me that that's not New Hampshire, Susan, but really staunchly creating the middle class and giving people that opportunity is what community colleges are about. And we do that by maintaining affordability. Uh, you can see on this slide that uh, Shannon is showing us, we, with your help, have been able to maintain our tuition. And in fact, when we first raised our tuition, we saw a decline in enrollment. We think we are at the price point. And I will um, say to you about the, the whole conversation that we're having um, about merging the two boards. I think this is a good idea. I think it's an idea that requires investigation, but I'll tell you my fear. The University of Alaska merged their community colleges and their university system quite a long time ago, the late 80s. And, and people were very cognizant of the community colleges. And so initially they, they were able, the university uh, system was able to offer the community college students a lower tuition. But as time went on, they couldn't do that any longer. There were needs. And, and frankly, uh, for those of you who may remember an old play, The Man of La Mancha, there's a line in it that comes to mind for me here. This is uh, whether the stone hits the pitcher or the pitcher hits the stone, it's bad for the pitcher. The community college system is the pitcher. And so as we go forward and as you go forward and consider this idea, I want you to think about what it is that we do for those two New Hampshires. If I go back to the statistics that have come out, People who are making 150,000 or more in our state and across the country have been absolutely fine through this pandemic. The people who are making less than that have experienced real difficulty. Um, one of the points that I'm proudest of is on your screen right now. I've talked about creating the middle class. Uh, one of our claims to fame is the value of a community college education. People in our state who've attained a degree have moved two or more economic quintiles from where their parents are. As a parent, you want your children to do better than you have. And we are like the good housekeeping, or we have like the good housekeeping seal of approval. Our students do well, and in fact, our two rural colleges, White Mountains and River Valley, are um, they, they actually lead the nation in terms of what the impact of a community college education is for these folks. Um, this slide here looks at graduation rate. Um, one thing about graduation rate, and you can see that our graduation rate is 33%, and you might say, well, you know, what are you so excited about, Susan, with a graduation rate of 33%? But I want you to understand where that comes from. So this is a federal requirement. So a, a brand new freshman who's coming full-time, which, which is called a first-time freshman, is part of this count. And then for our uh, community colleges, 
they look at how many of those students graduate in three years. What happens to our students is they start off full time and then family and work get in the way. And I don't, I, I hesitate to say get in the way because those are absolutely crucial pieces. So that student who started off full time three years from now may very well still be with us, but he or she is not full time. And so they are, con we are considered a failure because they didn't graduate within the three year period. If you look at what's happening in community colleges, you can see that we are outpacing our uh, sister institutions. And we've done that because of work we've done with national entities to raise the graduation rate, to look for ways to sustain people. We've grown by 10 percentage points in five years. We want to grow at least that over the next five years. Um, as Shannon is bringing us through um, a list of all of the employers that we have done work with, um, several more pages here. Um, I hope that I've given you background about who we are and the work that we do. I see Eversource here. I had mentioned I wanted to give you two examples and I only gave you one with BAE and Nashua. Eversource has worked with Manchester Community College to create a line worker program. Those folks are with us for less than a year and their average starting salary is about $75,000. There's still more opportunity there. There's more opportunity to work with all of our partners. And I, I'm pleased to tell you that we continue to do that work despite the pandemic. So I think I've left maybe just a couple of minutes. Scott, will you take us through the budget please? Absolutely. Thank you, Chancellor Hewitt. Good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Fields. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Community College System. I am at home in Intervale, New Hampshire. My family is on the first floor and not the basement, so I, I think I'm doing okay. Uh, I just wanted to run through the FY22-23 efficiency budget. You know, this request is developed with a focus on the continual improvement of our student outcomes mentioned earlier in this presentation. And as Chancellor Hewitt just said, this outlook has allowed CCSNH to become the leading community college system in all of New England in terms of these graduation rates and economic mobility. With this in mind, the requested increase over the biennium will allow us to maintain these student first focus and to continue to be a key component in the state's economic engine and recovery during this challenging time. The state's support of CCSNH's mission is a crucial component of our funding matrix as a percentage of our tuition and fees revenue compared to state appropriation has shifted quite significantly over the last five years. Just to give you in terms of the national perspective, the average reliance on tuition and fee revenue at a community college is roughly 33%. CCSNH is approximately 17% higher than that and or nearly 50%. So your support over the last few years has provided us the ability to continue the success that we've had. And to just look at the numbers within our budget request, the increase from FY21 to FY22 is $5.3 million. The vast majority of that is predicated from our three collective bargaining agreements and mandated increases for things similar to the New Hampshire state retirement system uh, mandates that come out each and every year. So from FY21 to FY22, a prime example of this is the retirement system increase is going to cost the uh, community college system nearly $1.5 million from FY21 to FY22. That dollar amount is nearly 65% of our overall benefits increase in that one year. So essentially your continued support will help us to maintain the systems and our positive outlooks that we have right now and continue to go forward. As Chancellor Hewitt just said, we're looking to continue to grow these outcomes over the next few years. Um, it's, I'm sorry, just getting my place here. So over the next, oh, thank you, Shannon. So what happens is in the FY22 budget, we are state, we're flat funded with the state dollars. Uh, that will allow us to continue 
where we were at right now while trying to find a way of absorbing the $5.3 million contractual increases that we need to have in order to maintain the successful outcomes that we're continuing to grow. Um, with the FY23 budget in question being rolled into one bucket, um, there's significant work that needs to happen over the next few years or in the next year or two that will help us understand exactly what our individual budget will look like at that particular point in time. Um, Thank you, One Scott. last thing oh, just to... Okay. Oh. Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. sorry. Uh, but one thing to just keep in mind is, you know, CCNH, CCSNH, excuse me, prides itself on being nimble and entrepreneurial. Over the last few years, we have worked diligently uh, as all other state agencies have to reduce cost and maintain costs where necessary. Our operating costs have dropped by nearly 8% from FY18 through FY20. We take being fiduciary uh, responsible actions each and every year and each and every budget in order to control our costs to show good stewardship of the money that the state provides to the system. Uh, this is something that we will... Oh. Keep going, Scott. I just want oh, okay. to show these oh, as okay. people are listening. Uh, so, you know, we definitely pride ourselves in this fashion and being able to be good stewards of the funds that you provide to us and look forward to continue to do that. Again, the request that we're seeking will allow us to maintain that same level of service across the board to our students. So it's just, it's, it's important that we are able to continue to move that needle, especially when it comes to 65 by 25. Again, we are a key component and economic driver of the state's recovery. Uh, especially in times like this when there's so many structurally unemployed folks that do need to be re retold, as Chancellor Hugh had mentioned earlier. Uh, Shannon, would you comment on these slides and Representative on the burger? I know we're slightly over, but if we could have one more minute, please. No problem. I, I tacked these slides on as an appendix. These come from uh, Brian Gottlob, an economist with the uh, Labor Market Information Bureau. And it looks really at what are those professions that are, um, that are in demand right now and, and projected forward to be in demand. And so many of them fall at the associate degree or certificate level, which is the level of education that we um, kind of specialize in. So this is just some detail that, um, that rolls up to the larger theme that the community colleges really exist to meet these workforce needs in ways that match the demographics of our community and the demands within, within each of our communities all across the state. And, and so I guess I, I wanted you to see this because this isn't just us saying this. This is, um, you know, a very, a very well regarded economist saying this who have, you know, looked at this data and, and this is what this is what they do for for a living. And this really folds into everything that we've been saying about our role here in the state of New Hampshire. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, we'll be happy to answer questions this afternoon. We look forward to the conversation. As part of the package that we've sent you, there's also a link to a document that gives you some information about how mergers have played out in other states. And um, because as this goes forward, um, I always say to the folks that work with me, let's make new mistakes. So we need to keep history in mind. We need to look at what others have done and then build on that. And we're confident that you can help this state and our residents and our community college system and our, our partners at the university system to do the same. Um, I really enjoyed working with my colleague, Catherine Preventure. The two of us see this as an and, not as an or. We are not in competition. We are in collaboration with one another. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you about our system. Thank you very much. Um... As you know, I love the community college system and I love the university system. So thank you very much. You've done a, uh, a great job in uh, letting us know where you come from and what you do. So uh, Mickey, if you could bring uh, uh, Catherine Provincher up to talk, I'd appreciate it. All right. They uh, Kathy and Tom Cronin are
pulled in now as panelists. And, I, and I'll leave the uh, CCSNH folks as panelists now, just in case some of the discussion as we move forward this morning applies. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, interim chancellor, is that the right term? No? <laughs> no, no, it, it's actually, so, so good morning. And um, thank you, Representative Umberger and members of Division Two. It's, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, even though it's in this uh, strange Zoom land. So uh, for the record, my name is Catherine Preventure. I am serving as the Chief Administrative Officer of the university system with um, Chancellor Leach uh, leaving his post as of January 1st. I'm also continuing to serve as the Vice Chancellor of Finance for the university system. And um, it's, it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. And Tom Cronin is with me. Tom is the University Systems Government Relations Director. Good morning, everyone. So, so um, you were provided <laughs> with some slides and I would like to, to walk you through that. You, you'll see the difference in the presentation between Interim Chancellor Heward and myself <laughs> in that I have spent my career in finance <laughs> It's probably heavier in, much heavier in numbers than, than Susan's presentation. Um, I 100% concur with Susan's comments. She and I have been working collaboratively ah. for a number of months now. And um, I look forward to, to continuing that, even though I think Susan's probably looking forward to her actual retirement in the not too distant future. So um, I will share my screen here, if that's okay. And, and walk you through um, some information about the university system and about our budget. So as, as Susan mentioned, you know, the community college system and the university system do have distinct missions. But the one thing we do have in, co in common is that we are a public resource to, to all Granite Staters. And the university system is also focused on workforce development in addition, you know, over $140 million a year is in research is conducted here in New Hampshire, primarily at UNH. We also administer the cooperative extension program across the state, which has impact, um, as you know, in all, in all corners of New Hampshire. We also have um, a number of programs that provide direct community impact all around New Hampshire. I'm not gonna walk through the details on all of these slides. By all means, if you have questions later, you can certainly follow up. Um, the COVID, as you know, has just turned life upside down for everyone in the state. And the university system has really partnered with the state on a number of initiatives since the beginning of the pandemic, setting up surge facilities, we're doing high capacity testing, not just for our students, but also for um, partnering with the Department of Health and Human Services. The UNH lab is being used to test, in, to test folks in nursing homes and um, correctional facilities, et cetera. Healthcare workforce, we've got, had nursing students come into the workforce earlier than they might have otherwise were it not for the pandemic. We also have a vaccine distribution center over in Keene so again, part of the public mission of the university system is stepping up in times like this. In addition to that, we had to completely pivot the way we, we provide education to our students back in the last a year ago. That continues. We provide hybrid courses, different um, adjustments to our calendars, increased support students for support services for our students. Um, Susan mentioned the impact this has had on high schools, uh, and it has also had significant impact on um, the learning and the support services our students need. We have been very fortunate to receive direct federal support as well as support through the state gopher office. Uh, we, when we combine fiscal years 20 and 21, we estimate right now, we still have about $46 million in unrecovered costs. Our costs for testing, PPE, cleaning, all of that over 20 and fiscal years 20 and 21 is about $80 million. 
We have about $76 million in revenue losses. That can be from dorms taken offline for quarantine, summer program losses we incurred. You know, when students have to go in a hybrid model, many of them don't want to come and live on campus if they, if they have a lot of online courses. So we have revenue losses there as well. Of course, we had a lot of operational savings. When you, when you effectively shut down a campus, you have savings there. You don't have the energy bills. No one's traveling. No, you know, we have, uh, so that we have also achieved significant operational savings, but there is a, you know, we still have a big gap there. So before the pandemic, we knew that we were, we were in headwinds and the headwinds were going to get much stronger in the coming years. This chart was published last month in the, the Chronicle of Higher Education. And you can see in the Northeast by 2025, the number of high school students is going to sharply decline. And so we need to prepare for that. That's also part of just in the last few years, just the competition that we see around New England for, for students. Uh, the state of Maine, you may have seen billboards. They're offering in-state tuition to out-of-state students. That's just an example. So we know we have to prepare for this big drop-off in, in um, the number of high school students coming into the pipeline. You couple that with our students have increased financial need. Our students and their families have increased financial need and the pandemic has exacerbated that. So while we have, this is just through 21, enrollments tick down a little bit because of demographics, because of competition, the financial aid our students require is increasing and that puts pressure on the bottom line. I will say that this, this projection for fiscal 21 is exclusive of one-time COVID impacts. We've been trying to model kind of parsing out the recurring activity from this one-time activity so that we can plan for the future. And that gets me to this, this modeling. We built a roadmap, if you will, last spring, knowing that these headwinds we were coming into, what do we need to do by fiscal 23 when this pandemic is behind us to make sure that we are on a path of fiscal sustainability. We put a bunch of assumptions in the modeling, demographic declines for enrollment, increased student financial aid, and a number of other assumptions. We, we also assumed flat state funding for 22 and 23 when we built that model, flat with what the, the operating, the, the recurring operating support, if you will, from the state. Based on that roadmap, we need to take $70 million out of our cost structure or about 9% of our budget by 2023. And we are on a path to do just that. This is very high level. This is university system wide. The modeling shows how our revenue is going to continue to deteriorate. And so we need to take $70 million out to get to a place with a very small amount in the black. So what are we doing? Frankly, we are restructuring everything we can get our hands on. The first thing we did on in for fiscal 21 budget, everyone had to roll back to fiscal 19 actuals. We are restructuring all financial and administrative services across the university system. We are up to our eyeballs in that right now. We are restructuring our entire benefits program. And there, that's, that's system-wide. There are also a number of campus-specific restructuring and expense reduction initiatives in place so we can achieve that by fiscal 23. So this shows you the, um, the state operating support. Now I can tell you this excludes the one time when, I, when we talk about the reduction that we, that we um, have in House Bill 1 as proposed by the governor. This, this percentage does not include that one-time money. We received one-time money back in, oh, that's a typo. This should say fiscal 20. Um, so the governor's proposed a, a $4.5 million cut in fiscal 22 from our current $88.5 million. That's about a 5% reduction. 
now I can tell you what, I admittedly, I don't know what this is gonna look like for fiscal 23. So I just took 60% like it is now. That's another reduction is the only point there from fiscal 22 to fiscal 23. Our board, uh, when, we, when we put our agency request together, the flat funding at $88.5 million, we committed to continue to freeze in-state tuition over the upcoming biennium. And it's also, it was also frozen in the academic year we're in now, <clears throat> excuse me. Our board just approved a, an in-state tuition freeze last month for the fall. And um, that again, that assumed the $88.5 million. We have not had any discussions about changing that, but that's, a, that's going to have impact on us again, put more pressure as we take that $70 million out of the cost structure by 2023. What do we use the appropriation for? Effectively tuition subsidy. We buy down, the state buys down in-state tuition. We also fund services such as cooperative extension, the agricultural experiment station and others. And the total state appropriate, the operating state appropriation funds about 10% of the total university system's operating expenses. This is a graph showing, again, the continued and increasing need on the part of our students. So the, the USNH funded direct student aid is continuing to increase each year. And back in 2018, you may recall we, um, the university system adopted the Granite Guarantee Program, effectively having free tuition for students who are Pell eligible. By fiscal 21, you'll see we'll have four years of that in the, you know, this pipeline of students. That's about $18.7 million, we estimate. You're also aware we provide um, tuition waivers to National Guard members. That's about $2.7 million last year um, or 722 National Guard waivers and effective this July 1st, we have um, the tuition waiver for dependents of disabled veterans and that will start this summer. You can see the difference here. This is tuition and fees, the difference between an out of state and, and a resident. This is what we call the sticker price. When you look at the net price after financial aid, it's pretty much stayed the same since fiscal 16. Um, I would guess that by fiscal 21, that's gonna tick down a little bit because we held tuition flat and um, financial aid continues to increase. These are metrics you're, you, you may, <clears throat> excuse me, have seen them in the past. We provide a dashboard to the state treasurer's office quarterly. You can find the entire dashboard on this link or on the state treasurer, treasurer's website. We continue to have the, the highest graduation rate of the New England publics. I use six year because that's what the, the federal government uses. We also have the lowest student loan default rate. What we take from that is our students are able to graduate on time and gain employment to pay off their loans. And then we also have the lowest administrative expense per student in relation to our public peers around New England. There are a couple of other items in the budget that I, both House Bill 1 and House Bill 2, I just wanna make you aware of. I'm gonna tread very lightly on this, this topic here. The, um, the uh, I, we haven't seen the final language yet, but in House Bill 2, there's a loan repayment program. And I have to tell you that I'll speak for myself, that program could have real impact on workforce, economic and business development in the state. Um, and I, again, I'll speak for myself, that's probably a very impactful program. The program will be funded by redirecting about 60% of the dollars in the unique program each year. And those, those dollars fund currently fund an endowment portion to that unique program. I, I wanna be clear that that endowment 
can only be used, the, the earnings on the endowment can only be used for student scholarships. It's a trust document. It can't be used for anything else. The impact of, of this um, redirection with no other changes in rule would be about $200,000 less per year in scholarships for our neediest New Hampshire students. And that grows. So it's $200,000 in the first year, 400,000 in the second year, and, and on and on, 600, 800. Um, we, I, I would also agree that there should probably be a, a um, change in the way that the al that allocation is split right now as far as what goes into direct scholarships and what goes into endowment. Um, but I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of this. Uh, I have not yet attended my first commission meeting and unique commission meeting in my uh, added role. So again, I'm, I'm treading lightly on this, but it is, it is an area that could impact university students in the future. The other item in House Bill 1, <clears throat> excuse me, funding is zeroed out for these two programs that um, are administered through UNH. They're federal programs and the match has been, the federal match, well, I should say the state match has been funded by the, the state in past years. This um, SBDC, Small Business Development Corp, it's required that it be hosted in a college or university. UNH has proudly hosted it for 36 years. It provides about $400,000 a year in in-kind support, but the match this year has been wiped out. And excuse me, also there's an Innovation Research Center, which is a state statutory program. The state support for that has also been zeroed out. Um, so are we, are, were we to continue the program, that will be about another $1.4 million over the biennium that would need to be absorbed by the university system in addition to the reduction in our state operating support. That is going to conclude my presentation. I, I, um, I hope to provide you some time for questions if possible, but I wanna close with the reduction in the university systems operating appropriation will have impact when, at a time when we are doing everything we can to reduce our costs, to get to, back to a place after the pandemic of fiscal sustainability. And you'll find my direct contact as well as Tom's at the end of your presentation I would urge anyone to um, contact us with questions at any time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if you hear noise in the background, someone's trying to call me. That's one of the, uh, the bad things about Zoom is that your telephone rings no matter what. And uh, it's, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to prevent that from happening, but uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate it, and um, uh, I read, you know, sort of the listen to the draft language, I guess, about uh, unique, and um, that's obviously something that um, if you don't know a lot about it, we're going to have to learn uh, a lot about unique, the 529 program, as well as the, uh, as well as the two other programs that uh, uh, were mentioned, um, because those are obviously things that uh, we need to, we need to be aware of, we need to make decisions on, and um, we'll see what happens, so. It, to, to that point, Representative Umberger, if, if, there's an interest, um, I'm sure the community college system can as well. There are other groups in the state that, that may be able to inform you even better than we can on those topics. So happy to connect you with those, those folks if it, if it would be helpful. 
Oh, I'm sure it will be <laughs> as we as we proceed down this path. So uh, we're now going to turn to Matt. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am here, Representative. Is the governor going to be able to uh, join us or not? I believe he is still on track for 11.30. Uh, so it might just be another minute or two. Um, I'm happy to, to take any questions to kick things off or if the committee wants to take a five minute recess, uh, whatever your preference is, uh, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Why don't we just uh, kind of go in a holding pattern, a recess, and uh, we'll be, when he shows up, Mickey will uh, get us all Is that the right term, Kathy? <laughs> for uh, for your presentations this morning, I think that it uh, really helped us to um, see the overall impact of uh, both the community college systems and the uh, university system. And uh, uh, I think in the, in the past we have, uh, or at least I have not in the past. Um, I understand the systems, but haven't necessarily uh, delved into all of the things that need to be done. And um, this uh, proposal, I think, is uh, certainly changing my concept of uh, of what's going on in the in the two systems. So uh, I. Uh, I really do appreciate what uh, what you've presented this afternoon or this morning. I'm sorry. And OK, the governor is with us, so um, I will. Uh, good. Good morning, Governor. Um, I would like. Oh, OK. And uh, I'd like to. Uh, Welcome you to uh, Division Two, and to uh, speak to us about your vision of the uh, combination of the university system and the community college system. So thank you very much, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Sure, sure. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come to uh, to. I was going to say come over, but I guess we're all sitting in our, our own locations right now. Um, so, I mean, just not to be repetitive, but to reiterate a little bit of, of what we I talked about in the budget address, and then we can take it into kind of another level of detail. Um, this is just all about evolving our system so that so it doesn't get crushed. And I don't mean to speak in such hyperbole, but that's that's really um, ultimately nationally where a lot of these systems, uh, if they do not evolve, uh, meet the needs of the consumer, that being the student, the parent, the new paradigm, as I call it, of variables that parents and students are looking at when they're making decisions to enter uh, a higher education or go, to go into the military or to get a job right out of high school. Um, we can't just keep pumping, and it isn't just about the dollars, but you can't just keep pumping up the same old system decade after decade after decade and expect to, to be successful. You have to evolve with the times and, and with where the market is going. Um, we know that uh, you know what we're talking about today was something that was seen maybe five or 10 years out uh, in terms of a, a real dynamic shift in where higher education was going. Uh, studies three or four years ago were showing that uh, up to 50% of mid-sized colleges would be closing their doors uh, in the next, in the next, you know, I think it's a five to 10 or 15 years. Um, and really what COVID has done is COVID has accelerated all of that, really, right? So, um, you know, because COVID forced the issue of a lot of folks that previously may not have considered something like online education or, or folks who might have been saying, well, it's got to be a four year college. But you know what? Because of COVID, now they're looking at other alternatives. They're looking at other other pathways. And so all this has really been accelerated. And so what we're really trying to do is to say other states have done it. Some have been successful, some not as, as successful, but there are good models out there. And we're saying, why is it that we have two systems that effectively compete against each other that offer very different pathways? and that are very siloed. So you have effectively really the seven 
um, individual locations in the community college, the four within the university system. That's really 11 different um, systems. Well, let's get them into one. And the, and the benefit there isn't just about saving dollars. I got to be honest, I think we'll save some money, but I don't really care about that. That's not what this is about at all. It's really about creating a pathway that is much more conducive for that student. Um, the students of this Gen Z or whatever generation is coming next, I'm not sure what we're going to call them, uh, but this next Gen Z and, and the students of the future are really about options, are really about smooth transitions, um, are really about making sure uh, and go, going into a system saying, well, maybe I don't know what I want to do at 18 or 19. Maybe I had a plan on a four year, but now I want to go to two year or now I want to get a job or whatever it is. Asking that student or telling that student, well, you have to get out of this system and reapply and get into this system over here and it's completely different. It's, com it's massively inefficient and it just creates a better, a, a, a rougher outcome, if you will, a rougher pathway for that student. As, if, as opposed to saying, look, New Hampshire is one unified system. You come in, you can take a hundred different pathways, right? And that's, and it's seamless and it's easy. Do you know, right now we have over, I think you guys may have discussed this, over 100 agreements between all the different, between Nashua Community College and UNH and Plymouth State and Manchester for college credit transfer and what, what transfers and what doesn't. There's literally over a hundred agreements out there. It's massively confusing on the back end. And it just, I think, accentuates the fact that we don't make it smooth for students. We make it a challenge. We can say that we have issues with, uh, we allow credits to transfer over, but not always and not for all classes. And it's still going out of one system and into another. And so this is all about, uh, I call it, if you will, school choice for higher education, right? Um, and, and that is where choice is most important because that's where these young adults are really making their decisions about their future, about their careers, about their jobs. And so it isn't just having, I, I always give the example of you know, a, a nursing student who wants to do a research and development project at UNH but she's a nursing student at Manchester Community College. Why, why shouldn't we allow that to happen in a seamless way? Or someone at Plymouth State that wants to, that says, you know what, I'm taking some great classes at Plymouth State, but I wanna be more hands-on, right? I wanna be a business major, but I wanna also, I wanna be in the, the, the construction and mechanical field. I wanna take welding courses to, to know what, you know, what that end of my, of my career path that I'm trying to design for myself is. So it's not just business classes here, but it's business and hands-on classes um, that again, when that student graduates with that degree and moves on, they're just so much more prepared. And as a parent, I mean, I'm gonna take my governor hat off. As a parent, I come at it from, I got a 15 year old and I got a 16 year old. So, so I'm, I'm going I'm through going this, this dynamic question of myself of, for my kids, okay, well, what system is best? What system is gonna provide the most pathways? Cause my kids don't necessarily know, aren't gonna know what they, what they wanna do. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do at 18. Um, and you know, you kind of pick a school or, or pick a pathway and you hope for the best. Um, I just think that we have an opportunity to create massive efficiencies and not ask students and parents to do the, we'll hope for the best come on in with an idea of what you want to do, but even if you change your mind, even if you find something more exciting or something more interesting or that something that suits your skill set, that, that same system is going to be there to provide for that. And so that's really what this is about. Now, we didn't come in and pre-prescribe exactly what this should look like. I, I engaged with the community college. I see Shannon on here. I engaged with Shannon, oh boy, well over a year ago, I think, and we batted around some ideas. I brought, then brought some board members in from both the community college and the university system and said, look, let's start designing this. Let's start planning this. And I, I don't, I mean, they were on board with the concept, but I, I think, to be honest, I think they were hesitant because they just didn't know if they were gonna spend a lot of time designing a system, but get pushed back here or there from their own boards or their faculty or whatever it was. So there just wasn't an impetus to really drive forward and say, we gotta get this thing done. Um, our pathway now is to say, we're gonna take five members of the community college, five members of the university system board, put them together. Uh, we'll then see what the gaps are. And by that, I mean, you know, maybe some folks from one system or another, they have some financial experience, merger and acquisition experience, but then we don't have any legal experience on that board because there's gonna be some legal issues with this merger. I then will bring in five more members to, with skill sets to fill in those gaps where it needs to be not political wonks or anything like that, just folks that know how to actually get this done. And what I've been very clear to both boards is you can pick who you want, but this isn't showing up for a board meeting once a month 
checking a box and having a couple of discussions. I need five individuals on both sides that want to really dig in, get their hands dirty, look at the financials, the IT mergers, uh, the what's going on in the back end, how to make it a, a seamless um, uh, a, a, a curriculum program uh, for the students, how to bring faculty together, right? Um, and we've gotten a lot of very positive feedback, obviously, it's it, on both sides of the aisle, you know, on the political spectrum. So we know it's not a political issue. We've got a lot of positive feedback from faculty, from students and parents are thrilled with this concept. Um, and what we're seeing is we could study this some more. We know where that what happens with that. Um, or we could just get in and we can do. Um, we just don't have the time right now, if you will, to take five years and see how it goes and study this and study that. The data is clear. It's out there. It's been studied. It's it's all right there for us. So that's not the hard part. Um, actually getting the right folks in the room and making this happen. And I've given what my idea is to give them a kind of a one year deadline. It doesn't mean the whole system has to be done, finished, designed, finito um, in a year. I don't think that's a practical expectation, but it, but we have to, I think, give them the, the idea to bring something back to the legislature, give them a year to do the design, bring something back to the legislature, knowing that it's going to get tweaked. There might be a plan A or a plan B or a plan C. We're going to hit some bumps in the road to start, but really kind of lay out that framework of design over the next six to six to 12 months and then come back to both the legislature and the people of New Hampshire and say, this is what this is going to look like and go. If you don't do it now, if you stall and study and wait, it ain't never going to happen. And where our two systems are going to wither on the vine. We're not going to be competitive. And, and more importantly, they're going to keep competing against each other. I mean, the massive inefficiencies, because as you go to online learning, right? You, you have the community colleges doing some online stuff. You have the university doing some online stuff. You, uh, uh, UNH, you have Plymouth doing some. They're both, they're all competing against the private sector, the snooze and whatever of the world, which obviously have their own pathways for individual students. But everyone's competing against a, a, a dwindling pool, as opposed to saying, we're going to pool our resources together, provide a much better product for the student, and we're going to go. And we're going to, you know, market this. Now, each individual, the 11 units, if you will, the 11 locations and facilities, they still maintain their, their locations, their identity, their brand. That's very important. Nashua Community College has to maintain being Nashua Community College, and Plymouth State has to maintain being Plymouth State. But that's just the entry doorway to a bigger system that broadens folks. And the vast majority of students will still stay, you know, the, the Plymouth State students will still likely take the most of their classes and on options at Plymouth State, same with UNH and, and otherwise. But to have that option, right, that, that smooth revolving door from one location to another where you're not reapplying and you're not going th through hoops, it's a seamless transition where you're just taking another class or you're working with professors from another location, the whole system is open to you as a student. I think that's an incredibly exciting thing to be offering. And I don't, I got to be honest, I don't think it's nearly as hard as people think it is. I really don't. Um, you, you have much larger entities merging all the time in the United States. They might be private entities and whatnot, but you have much larger M&A uh, acquisitions and going on and much much heavier heads butting together, as opposed to two public systems that know where they are. They don't have to redesign. They don't have to necessarily rebrand. They just need to kind of put the back ends together and create a seamless front end for the students. It's, it's not a, a huge leap. I know a lot of folks like to think, well, this is gonna take a, a decade to complete. No. It's not going to take no, no. Any merger and acquisition that takes more than two and a half to three years to complete was never designed right in the first place. So we know this can be done. And, and, and again, it doesn't mean that we have to give ourselves an end date of one year and then we're it's, it's done or it's not. But really putting, I think, that framework together, allowing the boards and those that are on the front lines of this to have a lot of the input in that, as opposed to the governor and the legislature predetermining and dictating it. Um, the date is there. And so, uh, again, I think the time is right. Um, uh, unfortunately, what the data says is if we don't move now, um, we're just going to get further and further down the road. We're also at a crossroads of opportunity. Neither of them have chancellors right now. Even I think Jeremy, the, 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 the head of the board over at Community College is, is now has indicated that he's going to be moving on. So you don't want to bring in chancellors to two systems, knowing that you're going to merge the systems, whether it's a year or three years down the line. Um, and then maybe have to go find another chancellor that works better with this new newly designed system. The opportunity, all the stars are kind of lining up to get this done now. To, 
look at where the system is going to go, you know, bring them together. Um, and then you find an individual or, or a team of individuals that have the right skill sets for that newly designed system, right? Don't bring somebody in. Um, I mean, bringing somebody in to be a chancellor system is hard enough. There's already a transition there. You'll be in endless transition, I guess, is my point. Uh, if you bring them in and then immediately charge them with the task of bringing everything together, that, that's that's too much to ask of any individual, and it's not fair to them or, or the systems or, or the process that you're trying to set up. So, so the timing is just really, really, really good. Everything is lining up. Um, it's it's a, I think it's a bipartisan, positive effort. Um, my only fear is that we slow down. Frankly, um, I don't. I, I think you can push it. I think we have. If I didn't have faith in the individuals on the board. Uh, and the individuals that are that are managing the community college, the individuals that are managing the university, we have awesome, awesome teams there right now. Really good teams. If I didn't have faith in those individuals, I wouldn't be making this 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 push. Um, but we just have the right teams at the right time and the right moment to make this thing happen. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's that's kind of where I am. I could go on all day, as you guys know. But um, but again, I think allowing for that flexibility and not predetermining everything is is actually a real asset to us in allowing those boards to come together. We fill it in with skill sets, real skill sets uh, that would be required in, in such an endeavor. I think the next year could be really exciting and then we can launch something, at least the, the preliminary first phases of it uh, within a year or two. I, I, I think you just got to get started now and you know the, the stars are aligning. Let's, uh, let's seize the opportunity when it's presented to us. Uh, Governor, would you mind taking a couple of questions? Sure. Okay, so folks, uh, anybody got their hand up? I don't, Representative Weiler, I see that you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, right now our task is to try to uh, complete a budget and we don't have any forecast that's gonna help us whether this is gonna be a change, is it gonna be more money, less money and so on and so forth. And the other thing I fear is that normally division two has a history of being more generous to the community college than to the UNH, which provide a higher percentage of the um, budget to the community college because we think it helps more people in New Hampshire and especially more people that are starting out and, and, and can't afford a, a four-year college. So we want to encourage them by giving more money to the community college than we do to the UNH because they have far more accessibility to funds and, and so on and so forth and out-of-state tuition that helps them a little. And, uh, so here's, here's the quandary I see immediately. Um, if we gave a batch of money to this combined thing, is UNH gonna take the biggest share? Or are we still gonna be feeling that community college hasn't been left? Um, and by, by the way we did it before, we made sure that we were helping the community college and the, and the students the most needed by giving a little more money to the community college. And the UNH, since they had had more uh, accessibility to funds and so on and contracts, et cetera, that uh, they wouldn't need as much. So we were giving like, I think 20 some percent of the budget to the community college and about 8%. I see Kathy prevent you, she'd know it to the decimal point, uh, what we were giving to UNH. And uh, so my fear is how's the money gonna go to this combined? Sure. So let me address that. So in my budget, I propose basically level funding the university system in the first year, right, and the community college, both of them, because they're both going to continue in this next year exactly as is. Operations have to continue exactly as is. Nothing is fundamentally changing. Um, that's when the work is really being done. You're also bringing in a singular, you know, at some point, hopefully within the next year, you're, you, you're defining what this framework of this new entity looks like. Uh, you're bringing in and, and looking for a chancellor to handle that entity. And then in my second year of the budget, we look at combining that together. Now, again, you could keep it separate uh, for at least the next year, possibly, uh, you know, for the second year. But I think the opportunity is to bring everything together, have the individual chancellor, the individual system where you're funding it. And then it's, it's, not, it's not UNH versus National Community College anymore. It's one singular system with a chancellor that has the, op the opportunity to make sure all 11 parts are moving, right? Now, the left hand and the right hand are really working synergistically. The other thing I would caution is I, I have heard some talk of, well, just as you brought up, Ken, well, back, you know, back in the day, and you're absolutely right, the community college always gets a little more favorable treatment on, on the financial side and da-da-da-da-da. There's a lot of talk of yesterday. 
You got them. I think everyone has to move on from that. You know, I, I heard people telling me about when I discussed this con concept, you know, talking to me about, well, Mark Huddleston, da, 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 da. Mark Huddleston. That guy's been gone for years. I don't care about Mark Huddleston. I don't care about anyone that is not of today because it's all about tomorrow, right? And so I just, what I think the opportunity is to finally get away from the one system versus another. That's exactly what you brought up. We should never have one system competing against another when they're both public system. You have one system, a single chancellor and his team working with the, the individual presidents and managers of those, of, of the 11 units, if you will, I don't know what we want to call them, um, and saying, okay, based on the need and the demand, here's, here's how the money and how you manage it out. Almost like a business. You, you really need a CEO more than a chancellor, right? You need to see this as 11 divisions, if you will, of the same company, all providing kind of a different entryway, maybe a different, uh, different specialties, but it's really all of the same business, the same company trying to provide the same opportunity, which is the product, well, that's your product, right? That opportunity for the students. So I see a synergizing the systems, not only are you, uh, you're undoubtedly gonna save money, right? Cause you just, you don't need two IT systems. You don't, I mean, we, if you added up all the backend systems that we have duplicated, um, it's just, at, at, in its time, it served a purpose, but at this point and going forward, I think it's archaic. And I don't think we should be supporting that, that kind of inefficiency. So you can create massive efficiencies there. And it's a one system where you're not competing one against the other anymore. Um, obviously, UNH is the big dog, always has been, right? And, and likely it's going to be for, for quite some time. And that provides a huge opportunity for our system, but it's not the big dog over everyone else. No way. It is 11 on par. And you need to bring in a team and a chancellor that really understand and appreciate that. And so what we're doing is, I mean, let's face it. The, the inappropriate stigma that is out there is that a community college is somehow second tier. It's not. That the faculty and the students are second tier. They're not. They are not. And that's what we're trying to get away from. This whole idea that the community college is somehow second tier to the, no way. It's one of the best community college systems in the country. It's run so well and creates all this amazing opportunity. It is not second tier. It's right on par. And so that's why I get excited about bringing everyone onto an even level under one roof that will be treated as equals. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bucco, you have a quick question. Ah, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Governor. Um, so one of the advantages of, uh, of, of the community college is the resilience and the ability to adapt. And in fact, in their presentation there today, they have three pages of um, partnerships with employers um, so my concern is will, will will they become will they become one big will they be, still be able to adapt when it when if it, or will they become just too big and um when they merge no i think that i think that's one of the awesome opportunities if you look at the relationships community colleges have with employers and the relationships that the university system has with different employers um there's some crossover there but it tends to be a little bit different but again, it's all about the student's path, right? Let's say UNH has a great partnership with Lonza over at Pease, which is, you know, the pharmaceutical manufacturer and all, all that sort of thing. UNH is designing this giant bio life sciences opportunity and building. They're doubling their number of nursing and all of that. So they are going to naturally have their group of, of businesses and, and not just on a local level, but on a national level that they're interacting with, doing research with and developing with. And so why should the opportunity is now that community that the Manchester Community College student has all that same access, right? And vice versa. The students at UNH that maybe aren't into the research and development side, but want a little more of a local connection to some of to some of the more mid-size, um, more main street, real businesses, manufacturing, whatever it might be, because the community colleges tend to have much better connections to the manufacturing world. And as manufacturing from overseas is coming back into the US and will continue to do so uh, over the next few years, there's gonna be huge opportunities there. And, and as we all know, you know, manufacturing again was kind of had this stigma a few years ago and we're really changing that paradigm. So now those students are gonna be able to work through the community colleges contacts. All the, all the individual entities, those 11 entities still maintain their identities, their brand, their relationships, but we're just opening those uh, contacts which traditionally are separated now to everybody, right? You're, you're, if you are a post, you know, you're a higher education student in New Hampshire, you get the golden ticket to everything. We're not siloing you with that market segment 
or those, you know, or those businesses, um, we're letting everybody kind of play. And I just think that's a rising tide floats all boats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Heath, you have a question? Whoops. Thank you, Governor, for taking my question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree that the a number of high school students are reducing drastically across our state. But at the same time, we're seeing those reductions. We're seeing um, a huge increase in the number of young adults, um, middle-aged people that are seeking education in different ways. Um, just, I worked at, at SNU during the time they had their big explosion um, in terms of their online program. And so we're seeing different populations of people coming in. My big concern is that when you create a huge system that needs many, many different products, it gets harder for individuals to manipulate the system or to get into the system. And I just fear that the special um, UNH, for example, has its own unique, um, you know, if I'm a high school student, I'm getting ready, I want to go to UNH, that, that's where I want to go, because I want a campus, I want to play sports, I want to do all these things. But, you know, if I'm 35 years old, and I've got two kids, um, I'm trying to get my um, degree, my graduate degree, I'm only looking for those courses, and I want to be able to do it if I can online, that would be great. Um, how do I do that effectively? So I'm just concerned about creating a system that's so huge that all of a sudden we won't have that nimbleness that we see in the community college and we won't have that sophistication that we see from the university system. If you could respond, please. Sure, I, I mean, the, I'll give you a, the quick example I can give you is, uh, you know, a few years ago, this state could even, didn't even provide an LPN program for nurses. You could have an LNA program here you could have the, or go to the university and get your RN or go, you know, or you could even go, I think Manchester Community College had the RN program over there. So you had all these different programs, but we weren't even providing one of the most important certifications that you can get as a nurse. And I remember sitting down with a young woman, she was getting her through the governor scholarship program I created. She was, she was getting her nursing degree at the Red Cross and it was an LNA and she was a single mom. And she said, yeah, this was great. You know, they, to your point, it was very nimble. I could come in. I, I got my, L, my, my LNA and I said, well, that's great. What do you want to do? She said, well, I, I'd like to become a, a, an RN, but I, I can't do it, right? I can't do it because you got to, that's more of a, a, a longer time commitment. I'm a single mom. I don't have, we don't have those programs here. I said, what about an LPN? And then we looked into it. And we quickly realized there was no LPN program. The community colleges had gotten rid of it. They had refused. They didn't want to be nimble. Right, they wanted a system that stayed in their lane, right? So I had to force the com a couple of the community colleges to pick up that LPN program, and thank God I did because LPNs are what you find in long-term care facilities. is It's just a whole nother level of nursing and opportunity, and we weren't creating that bridge. So yes, the individual systems. It's true, a lot of smaller systems can be are obviously going to be can you can make the argument they can be more nimble but they can also be much more limited in what they're offering because, you know, for, for various reasons, for economic reasons or whatever. But now opening that door up, I'm just using the one example of nursing, you're providing a whole different pathway for that individual that wants to just take the night classes and get an LPN or wants to just take night classes, but still be able to get her RN because she's part of a system that has an RN degree program, but she can do it with the nimbleness of the community college now, right? So. The, it isn't, I, I don't, I, I, I think we, we shouldn't be looking at this as, look at what we're going to lose. I think you look at the, the, the bridges that we're gaining and those are bridges that create better career pathways for these students. I think you could take that to a, I'm gonna go back to the example I also gave of somebody who who's, uh, wants to get, in, get their business degree, but now they want their business degree, um, they're in the four year of college, but you know what, they, they wanna be in construction, they wanna be in manufacturing, there's huge opportunities there. But you know what, they want, to, they want to also understand what's happening on the manufacturing floor, right? How is that car being put together? How is that big piece of digital equipment being put together? Well, now the four-year university system doesn't offer those, but now they can take that. So instead of just entering the workforce with their, you know, their MBA or whatever it is, and their, you know, the, the, the Peter Paul School is wonderful for business degrees and all that, 
Now we're merging the 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 Peter the the academics of the Peter Paul School with the real world that the community college. That's nimbleness that didn't exist in the university system previously. So we're not taking anything away from the community college system. We're just adding their asset into that base. So of course, with any M and A merger, you're, you're going to have you can you can look at where it's going to. Well, this might not work here, and that might not work there. But if you look at it strictly from the student's point of view, we're not taking any nimbleness away from the community college system. Look, there's still seven community colleges that are part of one larger system, right? Now they're going to be, those seven are now part of a system of, of kind of a former system of 11, right? With a single point and a single marketing, a single brand. You know, that, that I think that that's an opportunity, or I should say a marketing and a brand that kind of lies over those individuals. So they're still going to Nashua, the Nashua, I don't know whether you want to call it Nashua Community College, I don't know, name it whatever you want. They're still going through that door, but that door, once you get through that door, it's a much bigger, bigger system behind it, and, and they get to build on the opportunities for their career path. Okay, I have two. I uh, no, Mary, let we, we need, okay. Um, I have two more questions, uh, one from Representative Petrie and one from Representative Lynn. Uh, if that's okay, Governor, we'll... Sure. Okay, thank you. Representative Petrie, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Governor, for taking my question. Uh, when I first heard this proposal, I was worried about uh, losing the advantage of the affordability of the community colleges. I mean, it's, that's probably the community calls of the best kept secrets of, uh, of this state. I mean, they, and, and you can transition on to the uh, university system. And uh, I heard those comments again this morning. Could you, and, and I heard you comment that you didn't really care about the cost, but the affordability makes that a very viable situation. Sure. I think the way we charge for higher education is also archaic. We're doing it the same way we've always done it. No one has ever challenged the system to say, let's just take the university system and then we'll do the community college. Well, every credit cost X. It's $13,472 to go to the university system of New Hampshire, right? And that's it. And then you go in and you take your courses and you do your thing. And the community college on average is $7,000 per year. I think there's an opportunity here to basically blow that up and say, let's design, I'm, this is just me thinking, and I'm no expert, but let's design a menu. Let's design, a. I mean, not a menu of, not everything a la carte, of course, but a menu that says, look, there's, uh, there's A, B, there's, there's pathway A, B, C, and D. And A is, a, is, is you know, the cheapest, and D is kind of the, the gold-plated version, the most expensive, the most immersive with academics and opportunity. Um, but there's some folks that want to go kind of open door B, and that has a certain number of classes here and a certain amount of of hands on there and a certain amount of research and development there and opportunity there. I just think there's a huge opportunity to re-examine how we charge for, for this all this stuff in the first place. The community college is an amazing kept secret, but also remember, it's the second most expensive community college in the country. I think we can go cheaper. I think you do that by providing more and better options, more enticing options. There could be pathways that are more expensive. There could be pathways that are cheaper, but I mean, it's 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 expensive next to Vermont. I think Vermont's number one, and and community and New Hampshire's number two in terms of cost. I just think there's an opportunity by doing this to allow to to get a little more creative about what we're offering. And it isn't just community college will cost you X, university system will cost you Y. That's a two year. This is a four year. Pick your door. Good luck. Hope you picked right. That's exactly what we're trying to get away from. Um, I think by offering more options, you have the opportunity to just provide more flexibility in that pricing. And, and again, it's, it, maybe it's not as immersive of a program. Maybe it's, it's more for, you know, single moms that have to, you know, be at home with the kids a little bit, but still want to advance their career or, or upskilling opportunities. Those can be a little bit cheaper, but not, and look, maybe, maybe at the end of the day, you still just go by the course. At the end of the day, we can't figure it out. And look, we're still going to say, if you want this pathway with these courses, you're not necessarily losing the cost there uh, or the cost opportunities for those individuals. I just think by putting it all together, it gives you the, the, the ability to be more, to explore the idea. Look, I think even if you don't put them together, I think both these systems have to get aggressive about understanding how they're, what they're charging and what, they're, what, what the product is. People have to get the value of the product. There's, it, there's a very good value in the community college, don't get me wrong, but I just think you can do better. 
and, and no one's ever challenged that. Everyone is just sticking in their lane. We'll go to the legislature, we'll beg for money, we'll compete against the university, we'll get what we can, we'll adjust our cost variables accordingly, we'll do our, our, our faculty contracts accordingly, and we'll hope that the students keep coming in. And, and we pray that next year is almost as good as it was this year. And hopefully, hopefully it'll keep working. It's not going to keep working, right? Because when you're charging 7,000 for the community college, it's a great product, but you're not charging seven, the snooze of the world aren't charging 7,000 for online learning. And so that's gonna force everyone to do more on the online learning side. And pretty soon both systems are gonna be competing each other for that, that lower cost product. The lower cost product doesn't just need to be online, right? It can be a more hands-on, more immersive, more traditional uh, product, but you do that by, I think, by kind of expanding the opportunities and, and kind of whiteboarding this thing, you know, tearing it right down and saying, look, here's our costs. Here's where we need to be. Here's the opportunities we can provide. And here's the different tiers that, that we could immerse within both systems. Thank you. Uh, Rep <clears throat> Representative Lynn, you have a question? Uh, thank you, Governor, for taking my question. And I, I guess I should say at the outset, I, I really do think that this is an excellent idea. I mean, I, I think that there will be, at least there should be some cost, some significant cost savings in addition to all the other things that you pointed out. But I, I guess my question is this. Um, I, I'm as, as I understand it, the idea would be to appoint this, I guess, 15 person board that would sort of work out the details and that I mean, you know that I'm sure that there are a lot of details to be worked out and that makes sense. The one thing I'm wondering is this: if you know, if if you're committed to doing this, and and I'm glad that you are, and the and you know, assuming that the legislature also signs on to do this, um, then I wonder if it wouldn't make sense to appoint a, a chancellor. You know now, or, or when I say now, I mean very soon before the before the one year period goes by, because I guess I'm I'm really sort of concerned that, and I don't mean to suggest anybody. I'm I'm sure everybody will operate in good faith and work you know very hard to to bring this about, but I'm I'm sort of wondering if if it doesn't make sense to have somebody that's kind of in charge from the beginning that can yeah. say you know that can sort of crack the whip. If, if it seems like things are, you know, people are trying to find reasons to sort of not make it happen. So that, that's my really only, only question. Would it make sense to appoint somebody sooner rather than later? Yes, no, I think you're, you're spot on, uh, Representative Lynn. Um, once, I think once we make the commitments, the board, you know, the legislature's on board, I guess what I, what I was saying, I, 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 I wasn't very clear. I don't want them to appoint anyone now before we've decided whether we're go or no sure. go, right? Sure. But you're absolutely right. You need someone kind of leading the charge, not just running the meetings, but really keeping the train on the track. It's a giant train. The track can go in a lot of ways. It's going to be a lot of work to manage this and keep this on board. I think you're probably bringing folks from both of the community college, you know, the operations side and the university side as well to support an individual. Maybe you bring in the individual as the new, the new, the new CEO, chancellor, whatever you want to call it. Maybe bring in someone in to say, look, you're our two, two to three year guy or girl or woman, and, and you're the individual that's going to drive this thing. And then we'll decide, you know, you give them like a temporary, uh, a shorter term contract to really put this thing together. And maybe they're the answer to manage it in the long term. Maybe they're not. Maybe you want to bring someone else in. But no, I think you're spot on. As soon as I think that once we can, if we can make this commitment and, and I'll say we're going to give it our 110% best effort. You're right. You need a manage someone uh, on the managing side, uh, really driving forward on this. I someone asked me who that would be. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can tell you what skill sets I think that person needs, but I can tell you I have nobody in mind. I have uh, no no pre, pre predilections on any of that. I'm just trying to make sure we're staying focused on can we do, you know does this make sense? And and by the way, look, I, I'm not saying what I'm proposing you know is is the end all be all only answer. Um, I think it's the I think what we've really tried to do is provide the best option we have to maintain flexibility to let the the boards really design the system. I didn't want to come in and, and predetermine much of that, but I think you're absolutely right. I think you do need someone at the helm very early on to keep this process on track to meet the goals and the deadlines that will have to be there um, if you want to if you want to be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. We so appreciate you spending this last however long with us. And, sure. uh, and I hope that 
that uh, in some ways that uh, you have cleared up some of the questions that uh, that our folks have, and um, we will uh, we'll be working through this somehow. And uh, and I really uh, I really thank you for joining us today. You bet. Well, look, I, I just if I may, Madam Chairwoman, I, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I don't do a whole lot of, of interaction uh, with the committees uh, because I kind of for the budget stuff, I usually let the you know, legislature has to make those decisions. Uh, but on this one, I think um, it is it is a leap. It is not a leap of faith, but it is a leap to say we're going to get this thing done. And I just I want I, I hope folks take it with the excitement and opportunity that I see it as um, it's easy to say no. Everybody can say no. Right. But uh, I think there is a whole lot of opportunity um, and, and to have kind of that bipartisan support, all hands on deck. Um, it'll be a challenge, but I just let's let's have some fun. Right? Like, let's just whiteboard this thing out and see what we can do. And and I and I really mean it. I know folks get sick and tired of me saying we're the gold standard. We kind of are. We're the pace setters for the rest of the country in so many areas of what we go after, whether it's what we're doing with drugs, what we're doing uh, with mental health, the opportunities we're trying to create in, in the business community, and now taking our, our, our higher education and saying, look, SNU made a leap of huge faith, if you will, a decade ago, 15 years ago, and they said, we're going to go really all in on the online stuff before anybody else. And they knocked it out of the park. They own the market on it, right? Um, everyone else who was kind of left behind is scrambling. Let's lead the pack. Let's lead the pack in the new design for higher education. So I appreciate the time and I appreciate everyone at least giving it, you know, it's full consideration. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Uh, committee, we will be um, getting back together. I've got uh, about five after 12. Oh, it's 10 after 12. So let's make it. Um, 20 minutes to one, that'll give you an opportunity to uh, have something to eat anyhow. So we'll, uh, we'll see you about 20 minutes to one. Thank you. Hey, um, Madam Chair. Yes. All right, uh, next Wednesday, uh, when do you, how long do you plan to go uh, for that uh, meeting? Okay, Mickey, what's next Wednesday? Uh, I think we have the Department of Education starting at 10 o'clock. Ah, uh, yes. I've, we've changed that. We've changed the meetings that week, uh, next week, uh, about what, four times. So um, we will probably go at least the two hours and probably into the afternoon as well, Joe. Okay, because my wife has an, uh, an operation uh, she has to go to on uh, at one o'clock in Portsmouth, so. I'll probably be here for the first two hours and then uh, have to leave. Okay, that's certainly no problem. I mean, we all have, we all have commitments, and uh, and I understand that. So well, well, I hate do... to miss. I hate to miss. That's, that's... I I got that, but sometimes it happens. So, all right, we'll see you back at twenty minutes to one. Thank you.